Hello everyone. We have so many people joining us tonight, so we are going to take a second as we all come in for our second event for Children's Mental Health Awareness Week. We have the wonderful Nyla Rock Van Lee with us. And as people are filtering in, I'm going to give you a little bio description of Nyla and uh, her wonderful years of all that she is doing for the mental health community and for our youth. Um, and give you kind of a little lowdown of what tonight brings for uh, our second event. Um, as always, this is a, a fundraising event for Children's Mental Health Awareness. And um, as I turn my camera off, you will see that the text to donate button and the, um, the phone number is going to be available for you to see. If you are interested in donating to the Youth Mental Health Project, please feel free to use the uh, text number or visit our website at ymhproject.org. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to um, start reading this nice, beautiful bio about Nyla, and then we're gonna get right into it because Nyla has some great information that I want to just jump right into. Um, we have a lot to cover. So our event today, helping kids build a self-care toolkit, surviving the pandemic and beyond with Nyla Rock Van Lu. Hmm. So Nyla Rock Van Lu is a licensed social worker, trauma-informed psychotherapist, an organizational development specialist with the Martha K. Selig Educational Institute at the Jewish Board. Her career spans over 10 years in direct human services practice, working with communities surviving multiple adversities. Hi, Nyla. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. Um, we have a few are we still waiting or should we just jump in um let's wait a little bit longer we can chat a little bit hi linda linda's here um hi, linda. Can... Linda. <laughs> my so... mom's here too oh really yes hi, Mama rock van Lu. <laughs> <laughs> is are you the rock or are you the van Lu? my mom's the rock and my dad is the van Lu. amazing hi mama <laughs> rock uh so yes as you can see the chat box is on the bottom. If you have any questions for Nyla, you can write it in the chat or in the Q&A button on the bottom. And also we want to make an option if you would like to join the video and make yourself a panelist to talk to Nyla over video very quickly. Um, you can raise your hand and we can hop you on. But Nyla has a great presentation. So, you know, just write your write your questions in the chat if uh, we can answer them right over over that way so we can still see the uh the wonderful presentation yeah um we have a, a lot to cover today and i don't i want to be able to be respectful of everybody's time so if it's okay with you guys i think it might be okay to jump in a little bit let's go jump in all right nyla wonderful. Hand over to you bye Thank everyone you. So good morning, everybody, um, or good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nyla Rockman Liu. Um, I am a trainer and consultant on um, youth mental health services, and I am a consultant and trainer at the Jewish Board uh, with the Martha K. Selig Education Institute. I also am a practicing therapist. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, anxiety in children um, and increased stress and anxiety related to our survival um, and continued, to, so continued survival of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're gonna just talk a few minutes about some objectives for the day. So today we're going to acknowledge our collective anxiety um, and our hope for the future we are going to, sorry, I'm trying to minimize my screen. Uh, we're going to understand what anxiety looks like in children in particular. 
Uh, we're going to have a conversation about how to talk uh, to kids about COVID-19. Uh, we're going to discuss some skills and practices on how to manage COVID-19 related stress and beyond. Um, and we're just we're going to discuss ways to build resilience for yourself and your children. Um, and so you guys can just throw it in the chat. Um, how many of you are parents of young children or adolescents and how many of you are practitioners. Uh, so um, I can just start to focus some of my conversation around some supports for you guys as well. Um, but this is kind of a, a general overview and some good supports that anybody can really use. And while they are COVID-19 oriented today, they really are universal practices that we can all adopt for ourselves. Um, so first of all, I want to just say that <laughs> we are in this together and it's still a pandemic and it's okay, right? Like there's nothing that we can do about it at the moment. We're trying our best. We're wearing the masks. We're getting the vaccines. We're staying home when we're sick. Most of us are working from home. Many of us who, who have the privilege to work from home are. Um, every day still has new um, challenges. There's still a loss of our social lives. Um, we there's still an erasure of our work-life balance. Like, can how many people have experienced a complete blur or complete erasure of uh, what life is like at work and what life is like at home? It just doesn't even exist anymore. And we're still dealing with uh, remote schooling in my neighborhood. The kids went back last week, and that was, uh, for many of the, the young people in my neighborhood, that was their first time back in a year. So we're all dealing with a lot, right? And we have survived a lot, and we should really acknowledge that and give ourselves a pat, a pat on the back. So let's just do that for a moment. Um, and yet we also want to make sure that to acknowledge that there's a dis disproportionate level of stress and worry for marginalized communities, right? So folks living with mental illness, folks living with pover in uh, poverty or with food insecurity, folks that have had real and ambiguous loss of housing, of their jobs and livelihoods, of their family and community members, um, there's increased socialized isolation. And so in my practice, we're noticing um, <clears throat> more clients coming in with increased um, or more acute um, anxiety and depression symptoms. There's increased domestic violence. People are home and people are agitated and people are out of work. Um, there's increased community violence. Um, people are becoming really sad and desperate and struggling a lot. Um, there's increased anti-Semitism, there's increased racism and increased anti-Asian violence all related to the pandemic and the ways in which our communities connect with each other, how we understand each other, how we understand what we've been through and how we practice compassion, right? And unfortunately, because of all of this, there are folks that have survived the pandemic um, facing a whole other level of stress. Um, and so we just want to take a moment to acknowledge that we hold privilege, some of us, many of us hold privilege and are able to make it through safely um, with our families intact, with our homes and our work intact. Um, without any threat of violence or, or harm to us. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about anxiety. Um, we'll talk about signs and symptoms. So the DSM kind of uh, is the uh, Diagnostic Statistical Manual is a tool that therapists and um, mental health providers use in order to diagnose folks um, with any range of mental health um, illnesses. And so the DSMs, uh, the DSM categorizes these clusters of symptoms as those that are associated with the diagnosis of anxiety, right? So there's a range of different kinds of anxiety 
diagnoses, but these are kind of the hallmarks. So the hallmarks are rumination. So kind of just constantly talking about the same thing and kind of being uh, focused on the same thing all the time. Excessive worry, increased nightmares, rest restlessness, trouble with concentration, sleep disturbance. So like that's waking up in the middle of the night or maybe even sleeping too long. Um, increased irritability, avoidance and fatigue. Um, and when, it, when we're looking at um, young people, anxiety can look very differently, right? And so we wanna be mindful of the fact that children experience the world differently, they make sense of the world differently and therefore sometimes their anxiety symptoms may look a little different. So with preschool kids, you'll see sleep disturbance and nightmares. You might see bladder control and bedwetting issues um, and tantrums. For um, kids ages six to 12, you, you'll see more irritability, some uh, somatic symptoms. So those are headaches, stomach aches, um, complaints of like physiological issues that may not be directly connected to an anxiety um, diagnosis per se. Um, you might see some increased social withdrawal and competition for uh, attention from caregivers. And then adults uh, and adolescents, you might see similar things, um, but some hallmarks there might be concerns around injustice um, increased social isolation. So like really not trying to spend time with friends or isolating from family. Um, you might see an increase in high risk decision making, um, lack of interest or total rejection of academic achievement is something that, you know, one year later, I'm starting to see in my practice that a lot of young people have really kind of just push the books away and really not interested in participating in the ways that they once had. Um, and part of that is about their, uh, their insecurity about not being able to achieve at the same levels they once had. Some of it is about learning in a different way and, and not really feeling as confident as they once did. Um, so in, in high stress circumstances, so in disaster, in pandemics, you might see increased anxiety symptoms. So you'll see feelings of helplessness and you know persistent concern, like always, always, always worrying, um, always being aware and mindful of where their caregivers are, where their family members are. Um, with ex in extreme um, circumstances, you might see loss of developmental milestones. So like sleeping alone, um, challenges with independent play, speech and toileting issues. And then in adolescence, you might see um, an increased uh, withdrawal, some shame and guilt and so rumination about that, looking for retribution. So trying to find ways to make sense of what's happened to them. And that might sometimes cause like a radical shift in their worldview. Um, which can be scary. It might mean that, you know, they may engage in more social activism and also depending on their, their worldview and their orientation, it might turn into some scary things. So you wanna just be really mindful um, of, the, of those symptoms. So you might see high risk decision-making like self-destruction and antisocial behavior patterns, like fighting more often, arguing more often, and there might be um, a experimentation with substance use, uh, things like that. Um, so you wanna be mindful when you're working with young people that children see and hear everything. If you've ever had a conversation around a child, um, they will repeat what you said at some point in the future and it's going to blow your mind and it shouldn't, right? They, um, they are very, very perceptive. They know when you're off kilter and they're really resilient, right? So we wanna be 
mindful and responsive to their needs and also know that for the most part, they're going to be okay. Um, and especially if you're here and you're getting the resources that you need to support them, they'll definitely be okay. So, but one hallmark thing that I like to, to share with families, with parents, with other providers is that when it comes to kids and anxiety, the more predictable their lives are at home, the easier it is to cope with external upsets. We'll talk about why that is, right? So, um, one of the biggest challenges is that anxiety can be a symptom of like a traumatic response, right? So when someone experiences like one or more um, traumatic, uh, traumatic events that kind of renders them helpless, you know, reminds them that the, that the world is not as predictable as possible, it creates these symptoms that may cause someone to be hypervigilant more worried about um, what the world will bring next. Um, it forces them to, to be more aware of their surroundings, aware of people, um, and maybe a little bit more gun shy in the future. And so in order to restore that, a lot of times I tell um, providers and parents that it's a combination of talking and modeling and really modeling is almost more important than talking, right? So, but they're, they're equally, or they're just as uh, important and um, both require some skill to, to support your kids. So um, develop me, when you're talking, you wanna use some developmentally appropriate language. Um, you want to use accurate vo vocabulary and it's okay to be honest. Like sometimes families like don't want to tell the kids the truth, but like I said before, they're perceptive. They know when you're lying. So you might as well be honest, right? Um, you want to look out for signs and symptoms. So some of the things that we talked about earlier, um, you want to allow space for conversation. And I know that we're all really busy, but kids are like, they will come to you at any moment to ask questions. And so creating space that's receptive is going to make them feel safer. Um, and it's okay to not know everything. You can say, hey, I don't know, and let's look it up. Or I don't know, let's ask somebody that might know more. Um, and then with modeling, modeling is essentially just our behaviors, right? The ways in which we practice the things that we talk about. And so um, we want to make sure that when we're when we're supporting young people, that we are practicing the things that we're teaching them, which means that we need to remain calm. We want to normalize things around us the best that we can. We want to establish and maintain a daily routine, right? So routine for children means that they can predict what's happening next. When they can predict what's going to happen next, they feel safe. Right. So if you think about the fact that a tra traumatic event kind of happens out of no nowhere and it's completely destabilizing, when a child knows that they can predict more often than not, then that will prepare them for when things get a little bit off kilter. Right. And so that means that parents have to manage their own stress the best that they can. That means that, you know, if, if it means like establishing a routine together, children like really do honestly thrive on structure. And so you don't wanna be overly structured to the point that the children don't have an opportunity to explore, but you do want an opportunity for kids to know that, the, that their environment around them is safe and that somebody is in control, right? And you explain to them, like, these are the practices that will help us stay safe. Um, so with young people, with adolescents, it can get a little tricky, right? Um, young people have been, adolescents have been home. They're kind of testing limits at this point. It's been over a year. They're struggling, right? And so we still want to open the floor to them to both manage 
some to help them manage and establish some structure, but also to honor the fact that they are growing and developing and have their own thoughts and ideas. And so we want to make space for both. So what I often do in practice um, is to help families establish a routine um, together, right? So the parents may have their own set of like house rules and maybe that young person can contribute to the house rules. Um, maybe they decide which chores they will do um, or you know the chores that they're good at. Maybe we establish some sort of token economy to kind of get them motivated to participate. Um, you want to have, you want to be as stressed as we all are. You want to still be open and available for them to talk, and also know that they may not want to talk to you because they're teenagers and they have their own friends, um, and they're kind of at a place where they're kind of distancing themselves and becoming their own people. So that might mean that they connect with their friends instead um, and you want to be respectful of their privacy and allow them to cultivate those relationships especially because many of them have not been able to physically be in the presence of their friends in so long um, and then when it comes to discipline uh, for families that that believe in discipline um, what I try to do is encourage them to think of finding uh, productive consequences so, um, rather than saying like you're grounded and you're sequestered to your room for the week or we're taking away your phone, um, we might say, well, you know, maybe you need to research why you might have done what you've done, or maybe you provide us with some sort of extra chore, or maybe you um, volunteer somewhere, like that is the consequence for what you've done that gets them active, that gets their mind going and doesn't feel like the same thing that they've already been doing. And a lot of young people right now are like kind of rejecting um, like grounding and you know things being taken away because it makes no difference. They haven't had things all this time anyway. So who cares, right? So we wanna practice some compassion as well. So now we're going to jump into the self-care toolkits. Um, and so what they are is a self-care toolkit can be a literal or figurative collection of skills, techniques, and items that help us with ground, grounding and stabilizing us when anxiety hits and it, when it hits hard. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about a figurative self-care kit first. So um, figurative self-care kits don't have to cost anything, right? They are um, ways that children can kind of gather an inventory of the things that work best for them for grounding. And this is truly just for anybody, but for today we're, we're focusing on how children might benefit, right? Um, oh, sorry, before we move on, there's a question about screen time during COVID. Yeah, Lauren, you can go ahead and share that. Unmute, let me get that. Off. There we go. Can you guys see me? There we are. Hi. Um, all right, so this is from Lori. Her question is, what are your thoughts about limiting screen time during COVID? How to give teens an outlet versus concerns about tech addiction? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that there's only but so much that we can really do, right? So we, that's kind of a, a decision that you guys make as a household. But absolutely, I would say reducing screen time and sharing a rationale about why, um, and then also understanding that some things will have to loosen until kids get back involved in some of the things that they're, they're excited about. The cool thing about um, a lot of the New York City kids is that sports started up again, um, that school started up again, and so we 
I would definitely try to limit screen time. If, if taking away the phone is something that you practice anyway, I wouldn't say like, let it go, but I would say um, maybe not taking it away for as long of a time um, and really kind of talking to your, your young person about what they're engaged in, what it is that is, uh, like who it is they're talking to or what they're doing and then finding some other like way to engage them. So if it means like having them go outside or encouraging them to go outside, even sending them to the grocery store or sending them on errands to support the family is a good way to engage them in like a support that's physical um, and that can reduce their engagement. I hope that I answered your question, Lori. Okay. So when we're talking about the these uh, like these imaginary or um, intangible self care toolkits, we talk about um, you know kind of a collection of of grounding skills and tools that kids can access and utilize when they're really struggling, right? So um, we ha help them uh, recall their coping skills, right? Um, we can do some breath work and mindfulness and we can talk about some mindfulness that I enjoy um, in a few minutes. Uh, there's affirmations and sometimes I have kids like write their favorite aff affirmation like or we might make one up for them and have them write it down and maybe put it someplace visible. Um, in, in, engaging in physical activity is an actual mindfulness practice, being able to participate in something that requires a um, mind and body connection really does help to support um, good mental health. Um, open and honest and compassionate conversation. Um, thought stop stopping is something that's pretty interesting where you literally, literally um, when, when negative thoughts start to come in and they start to become like big and scary, we, we tell ourselves stop. Um, there's guided meditation that it, that's online and there's bedtime stories. There's actually adult bedtime stories, which is pretty cool um, that you can find on YouTube, on the call map, on Audible. Um, and I actually use them sometimes too because I really do struggle with um, insomnia. So um, here's a couple of examples. So there's this faint feelings thermometer. This is something that we use in therapy a lot with young people. I, there's some that exist that are already like co colored in and like really pretty, but I like to use this um, or one that's like kind of freehand. And the reason why is because we want um, children to be able to identify their feelings themselves right? And to negotiate an intervention themselves with some coaching. So when I usually uh, work with young people, I might give them a thermometer and kind of explain a scale and say, okay, so um, please tell me like where you are when you're feeling great and color that in and color in up to the middle and then tell me when you need a small break and then use a different color for uh, when your temperature starts to rise and you need help, right? And what I usually do is after they've like decorated this the way they want to and they have their own um, definitions about their own worry, their own anxiety, even um, young people that um, struggle with anger. I, for, for therapists, I would send it home, but if you do it at home with your kids, um, I usually um, encourage families to put it on um, the refrigerator or on their door, someplace at eye level. And when a child is really struggling, you can stop them and bring them over to their thermometer and say, okay, so use your words. Remember when you did this, please identify where you are right now. And we can work from there, 
right? And what do you think it'll take you to get from, I need a small break to, I feel great? Um, or tell me what happened between, I feel felt great this morning and I need a small break right now. Did something happen? Let's share, let's talk about it. Um, and it's a really good way for kids to begin to identify their feelings and also to begin to um, self-regulate. Uh, which is a really great skill to have, as you probably know. The other thing that I like to do, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, the other thing I like to do is a gratitude inventory. Um, so you can have uh, your child like kind of freehand these circles. I made mine look like a teddy bear. Um, but basically you have the person, um, the young person or the, the, the kid right down in the middle, like what I'm grateful for. And then they list out in different categories, the areas of their lives that they have so a level of privilege of access of, um, of good things happening for them, right? So for this young person under health, they said that my family survived the pandemic and nobody passed away. And I get to go to the doctor and I get to go to therapy. Um, for living, I have shelter, I have food, I have a warm bed, I have toys that I like. Um, for school, I have help. I have internet and I have supplies and maybe I have a computer. Um, for family, I have a mom and dad who love me. I have my siblings, I have my grandma and grandpa. So you kind of get the idea that you are collecting all of these good things that, that exist in that, in that young person's life. And the cool thing about it is an, that, you know, you can also post this up in their bedroom. Um, or somewhere where they can see it regularly. And when the rumination begins, when the excessive worry be begins, you can say like, yes, I understand that this is destabilizing. I Well, that's a very sophisticated word for a child. I understand that this is scary, right? And also we have so much to be thankful for and we are going to be okay. And you just have the, the child go back and reflect on the things that they've said in the past. Um, and yeah, so I would get like, I would gather pencils and paper, color pencils and have them like really have fun with um, creating this. I've done it with adults too and it's pretty fun. All of the things that I do with kids, I try on adults. Um, and then we can talk about what a self-care toolkit looks like, right? So this is a physical self-care toolkit. And so essentially um, it's a special box or vessel that holds um, items that simulate five senses. So you have something in your box that um, is taste. Uh, so here, I sometimes I use Jolly Ranchers or Hershey Kisses and um, some of you may be familiar with the uh, mindfulness activity with the Hershey Kiss where you hold it in, in your palm and you examine it, you look at the light reflecting off of it, then you unwrap it, you listen to the sound, you put it in your mouth. It's like eating a Hershey Kiss is like a 10 minute activity. Um, but they're really cool to have um, in a box and you just like throw a few in there so that you, um, you you know where to access your tools when you're really struggling. Um, so we have taste, sound, smell, and touch. So what I like to do with sound is, this is a picture of bubble wrap and just allow the young person to like pop it and explain what they're, they're hearing. Like, what does it sound like? Does it echo? Um, do, is it scary? Did it scare the cat? Um, with smell, um, I like to use like really mild essential oils. Lavender is a good one and allow them, like you just kind of screw up the cap, cap and just allow them to take in the smell and, you know, tell you what it, what it smells like. Do you like it? Um, 
is it funky, is not your thing, whatever. Um, the, the young boy up here has a marble in his, uh, on his, that he's looking at. And so allow them to explain what they're seeing. How does the light reflect? What color is it? Is it like blue, green, or is it blue? Um, and same with touch, you know, allowing, uh, so this is a feather and some cotton. So sometimes I'll have in my box, like a few cotton balls or a couple of feathers, if I can get some from like a craft store. And um, when you, you need calm, you just like kind of like brush yourself or you can like fiddle with it in your fingers. Um, so my mom is here. And when my mom was a kid, she used to, um, she used to self-soothe with like the inside of um, sweatshirts. And she would like pick the fuzz apart. <laughs> And, but that was a, her way of grounding herself. And I, mommy, I don't even know if you recognize that. And I'm sorry for like putting you on the spot, but that's a great way for, for folks to um, ground themselves. And in, this is before like all of these like mindfulness tools came about. Um, and then with, with these tools, what I like to do with young people is to literally collect them in a box and um, have that, per that young person decorate the box. And like this box belongs to me and this box is for special occasions and it's mine and it's pretty and it's exactly how I want it to be. And so you don't go in there and you get your snacks, um, but you do get a chance to access it. So you put it someplace special, you put it someplace that you, um, that you, you know, where you would value it and make sure that you can see it and know that you can access it. So if I'm really struggling, I'm gonna say like, hey, or if, you're, if your young person is really struggling, maybe we need to go get that box and maybe we can like pick something, one or two things from the box and practice um, some, some grounding with you. Um, and so then there's a, other ways to cope as well, right? Um, for, for caregivers, it's absolutely important and essential that you are taking care of yourselves, right? You are no good to your children um, if you are not able to be well yourselves. Um, so I always recommend that caregivers set their own daily routine. That still means I mean, at this point, we've kind of learned this, but it means getting up, getting dressed every day. Like, there's something to be said about like actively waking up, taking a shower as if you're going to work, getting dressed. Even one of my coworkers puts makeup on as if she's going to work. And that really does set the tone for the day. And it set, helps you to set your intentions for the day. Um, you can set breaks for as a family. And what that means though, is that if, if when going back to pre predictability, if you know, if your kids know that there's going to be a break, then they also know that they can't disturb you while, well, they should know, and they will begin to learn and understand that they, that disturbance in between the break is kind of, um, less acceptable unless it's an emergency. So you might say, okay, remember we have a break at three o'clock. What time is it? Oh, it's 2.53. How many minutes until three do we have? And then you, you I promise you, you will have me, right? And so um, sometimes on that break, you, you might even put um, something on a, a calendar, like on your like work calendar. So um, a lot of people are putting their lunch breaks or whatever they have. Um, because as I said, the work-life balance has completely been destroyed. Um, it's important to kind of restore some of those boundaries with, with work. And so setting, making sure that you're setting breaks um, on your calendar, making sure that you're setting up lunch on your calendar so that people know that they cannot schedule you and that you are not accessible, right? Um, 
and provide a daily activity that your kids can do while alone. So sometimes it's going to be homework, but sometimes it might be giving them some crayons and coloring books. Um, sometimes it might mean providing, like allowing them if, if you have access to a backyard or a, you know, a space in your home where they can play, um, ensuring that they have like the tools and resources to play or engage in imaginary, in imaginary play. All of those things are really helpful to help you stay grounded To So if you're prepared with the tools that they need, then you have what you need to do what you have to do and absolutely build in rest. And so I know that that's really hard, but sometimes some families are actually like setting a nap time for their kids. And then just like when you have a baby and then during that nap time, you either do what you, like the things that you couldn't get done earlier, maybe you nap, maybe you connect with family and friends um, and reach out to your social networks as well. Um, and then see, these are some of my favorite other things to do. So um, Mindful Kids is a, is a box of activity cards that um, we I use a lot in therapy for folks of all ages. In fact, it says on the box, um, met for ages four to 104. So this is mine right here. I have it right next to my computer. I use it every day with pretty much anybody. Um, I really enjoy it uh, because they've got like some really fun activities that you can do. I recommend it to parents um, because they're really easy to do. And it's like mindfulness 101 for those of us who really don't know what, what it is. <laughs> um, the ungame is another fun one. So they have, it's like a game of just questions and answers. Um, they make it in all kinds of versions. So this one is for kids. There's one. There's an ungame for teens. There's a standard ungame. And in fact, I for my friend's birthday, she just got married. I sent her a couple's un ungame. Um, so mindfulness, mindful kids, and ungame can be found on Amazon. They're both under twenty dollars, and they're really cool ways to engage your entire family. Um, and then. The uh, five, four, three, two, one grounding exercise is really cool, especially when um, when kids are like when you don't have access to like your physical tools. Um, so, with um, the five, four, three, two, one game, it's literally a you can write it on a piece of paper or you can just do it in. Um, off of the top of your head if you're out somewhere. Um, and essentially how it works is you ask your young person to um, name five things that they can see, name four things that they can touch, name three things that they can hear, name one, uh, two things that they can smell and name one thing that they can taste. Um, and that's a great way to bring someone back from um, some emotional dysregulation. And then um, this other activity, I'm a strong tree grounding technique is one of my favorites. Um, so essentially uh, you, and there's like a lot of versions of this, you can kind of just find them online, uh, but you teach a child to literally feel physically grounded. So um, if for you, those of you who can't see what it says, it says a part of my feet um, are firmly planted like roots of a tree. I keep my body tall and straight like the trunk of a tree. I place my arms out above my head like the branches of a tree. And I breathe in and out slowly like the wind and the gent gentle sway. Um, and I gently sway my arms. And so, especially when kids are kind of bombarded with stressors. So if they're out in the community and it, it, things get very loud, things get very scary sometimes, um, I like to use this um, as an imaginative grounding technique where we go through those, um, those steps. And then we also say, and the things that are coming at me will breeze 
beyond my branches and go behind me. Um, and that's a really cool one that even my adult clients love. Um, and it's a, it's a cool visualization for folks that are really kind of in the thick of stress. Um, and remember that we are resilient nevertheless, right? It's okay to feel uneasy. That's completely normal and healthy trauma response. And like we said, some oftentimes anxiety disorders kind of um, grow out of a trauma that we were not never able to really reconcile, right? It's hard to, sometimes and you're still showing up. So you're doing a great job. Um, celebrate, let's celebrate how far we've come. Let's recognize that there are good things that have happened. Um, offer your time and resources to support others in need um, of love and care. So if that's family members, if it's volunteering, if it's donating, if it's baking, I bake like all the time. That's, that's my new quarantine um, hobby. And I can't eat it all though I'd like to. And so whenever I bake, I make sure that I just, you know, take use that opportunity to visit family and deliver what I've made and spend a little time with them or whatever feels good. Um, celebrate your wins um, and lean into your full range of emotions. And I cannot say that enough. It's okay to feel all of your feelings. All of your feelings are valid feelings, right? even the frustration, even the sadness, even the anger. And um, what I like to coach uh, clients on is saying, your feelings are your feelings. They're registering your body for a reason. Acknowledge them. Do we want to ruminate? No, we don't. But we do want to allow space for them to exist. Acknowledge them. Acknowledge why we're feeling them and allow them to move on. Um, just like any other feeling, right? We are not happy um, at all times. We are not sad at all times and we're not angry at all times, but all of those things exist for us for a reason. Um, so here are some resources that I like. Um, so there's some informational resources here, the National Child um, Traumatic Stress Network, the Mayo Clinic, um, Young Mind Self Soothe Box, is a place where you can go and um, get ways, you can get help on like how to build this the, the, these boxes. Um, children's Guided Imagery is a place where you can get some um, support around doing some mindfulness activities with kids. Um, yes, the Youth Mental Health Project is a place where you can get support. Um, Open Path is a sliding scale so a collective of therapists um, that are designed, that I think they offer the max is like $60 for family therapy. And I think it's as low as 20 or $30 for individual therapy for folks that do not have insurance. So sometimes I send um, people that are undocumented um, to open path, excuse me, the Jewish board clinics, um, and you can act, call us at 8441-CALL, NYC Well, um, at 888-NYC Well, or you can check them out online. The Door is a great organization for young people um, where they can get a full range of services from therapy to high school equivalency, to housing, to food, to um, college prep, absolutely anything, um, job prep, everything. So, and it's totally anonymous. Young people can go and register on their own and be a part of a huge community of young, other young people getting the support that they need. Um, the SAMHSA National Helpline is a organization, is a uh, line that you can call for any kind of support that you need in any part of the world, um, any part of the country, sorry. Um, so you can call them and ask them for any kinds of services that you might need and they'll be able to direct you based on wherever it is that you're living or the place that you're getting referral from. 
um, and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is essential. And I refer a lot of people, I just make sure that all my clients have it um, because people are experiencing acute stress right now and really, really do need an ability to ground themselves um, and talk to somebody. And you never know when your anxiety will really hit. Questions? Thank you so much, Nyla. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can either um, put them in the chat or the Q&A button on the corner, or if you would like um, us to bring you into a video so you can talk to Nyla, we can also do that and you can raise your hand, that little button on the bottom. Um, no questions. Thank you for sharing all of this information. Mm -hmm. You're so welcome, Terry. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Nyla, I also love this, <laughs> this image too. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Teresa I says, fun things. hello, is there a way to rewatch this? Yes, we are recording this um, and we will repost on all of our social media accounts. Um, we will send it to your email. It's going to be on YouTube. So you'll get a YouTube link and yes, I think that's, those are the main spots but it'll be on YouTube. Harriet says, very informative, thanks so much. It is like our emotions, dolls, kimochis. Oh yeah, those kimochi thingies, those little kimochis. Kimochis? Right? Those little, those little plush toys. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, Linda, Linda That's says, it's like our emotions, yeah. dolls, kimochis. Mm -hmm. That's so funny. Um, Nyla, thank you so much. You can buy them on our website. Oh, the oh yes. Yes, that's oh, one of our, our special gifts. Um, wait, do I have that? Lisa, do you have that image? Uh, let me see if I can find it. Yes, they're on our website. That's so cool. Yes, I'll find it. Awesome. Um, Linda, I totally forgot about, get, about those. I have to get one. Uh, Nyla, thank you so much. I, I, I do have a mindfulness activity. Oh, yes. Um, if there aren't any other questions, or maybe you'll, maybe as you're practicing, you will find new questions. So I ask that all of you um, sit up and find a comfortable position. Um, Make sure that your spine is straight and your body feels relaxed. Um, hold your hand over your heart and repeat to yourself, may I be happy, may I be safe, may I be peaceful, may I be kind. Now think of a friend or family member and repeat to yourself now, may you be happy, may you be safe, may you be peaceful, may you be kind. Now imagine people you don't know yet and repeat to yourself, may they all be happy. May they all be safe. May they all be peaceful. May they all be kind. And continue your day knowing that everybody wants to be happy, wants to be safe, wants to be at peace, wants to be treated kindly, and wants to be kind, just like you. Thank you. And here's my information. And make sure to donate to the Youth Mental Health Project. Oh, we have a question. Yes. Kelsey, do you have any tips on what to include in a physical toolkit for teens ages 15 to 18? Um, so yeah, I would, for, you can really use, I, when I first started using these toolkits, I was using them with adults living in um, supportive housing, but for the most part, with any kinds of toolkits, I recommend that you allow the person to choose what they want. 
So um, you can give them some suggestions, but if it's a candy, it's whatever candy that teen likes. Um, the essential oils are kind of like, um, they are age neutral. Um, with something to see, maybe you put like a photograph or something that they enjoy or some sort of like piece of art that they can examine. Um, and what is it? Sight, sound, smell. Oh, with sound, I still use the bubble wrap with teens. Um, and maybe use a feather or, um, yeah, I would probably use a feather over a cotton ball with a teenager. Any other questions? Do you have any other questions before we wrap up? You can send them our way. We have about three more minutes. We have a lot of thank yous, lots of thank you for this information. Thank you. Thank you all for being such a captive audience. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you for interacting, everyone. And it was nice to see where you where you all are. Mm -hmm. We're from New Mexico. That wow. That's amazing. <laughs> um mention the rest of the week events yes all right so for children's mental health awareness week we have a week full of free virtual events so tomorrow we have the mental health monologues and um we are presenting that at oh i'm gonna get that time wrong lisa remind me the time for the uh Seven, seven, <laughs> I was about to say that. <laughs> 7 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and we have more webinars throughout the week. On Friday, we have a, um, a virtual concert and then we have a cabaret on Saturday. So we've got some informational webinars. We have some live music. We have, we have monologues. We have a little bit of everything this week. So be sure to join us for the mental health monologues tomorrow at 7 p.m. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. As always, visit the Youth Mental Health Project website, ymhproject.org, for any more information. And Nyla, thank you so much. Thank you. I had a great time. So great to have you. And uh, we'll be sure to send this video and Nyla's information your way through an email. So uh, be on the lookout. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So much, everyone. Goodbye. Have a great night. Goodbye. Stay safe. Stay healthy. <laughs>